Hello, great souls. Welcome to our living yoga satsang today. Uh, let's begin together with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters of Self-Realization, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints of all religions, Friend and Guide, Swami Kriyananda, we humbly bow to you all. Bless us this day as we study these teachings of Yama. <clears throat> Help us to understand how to apply the yogic teachings to our own life in a way that is rich and meaningful and inspiring to keep us moving forward on our journey with joy. Be with us now and always and help us to awaken to thy divine presence within us. Om, peace, amen. Okay, great soul. So today we're talking about brahmacharya. This is the fourth yama. <clears throat> it's also known as non-sensuality. And there's many different things that uh, I can say about brahmacharya. I think one of the first things I'd like to talk about is how easy it is to confuse what's being asked of us with this practice. So sometimes what I've observed can happen for someone who's especially being introduced to the topic of yamas. So the yamas are about control and self-restraint. One of the titles I considered for today's uh, talk, it's really applicable to all of the yamas, is the gift of self-restraint. And brahmacharya really um, highlights the value of what happens for us when we have this ability to restrain or refrain or hold back a bit, right? And then part of the evaluation is what's right for you, what's appropriate for you. So some of the confusion that happens around brahmacharya or non-sensuality is this idea that the senses are bad and that we shouldn't enjoy them at all and if I do enjoy them, I'm somehow not practicing brahmacharya. And really, what's more to the point here is um, overindulgence or overreliance on the senses, and ultimately the direction of the flow of our consciousness and energy. So there is a challenge to the senses, and that challenge is that it makes um, it's very tempting to live. Um, with our consciousness always consciousness and interest and energy always being outward. So the senses can be very pleasurable or they can be um, unpleasurable. <laughs> I can't think of the opposite of that, right? They can, they can be, we can like them or not like our experience. And what can happen in very much we are, you know, generally speaking, outside of a traditional spiritual practice, we're encouraged to live in our senses, right? And certainly with marketing, we're encouraged to live in our senses and to avoid those things that we don't like, that are displeasurable, I guess that's the word I was looking for, and to pursue those things that are pleasurable. And in the practice of brahmacharya, what we're doing instead is to recognize the limitation of the senses and that when we live outside of ourselves, we limit our capacity for the divine qualities that, of our own soul nature. So we have, for, for example, I'll talk about a difference between happiness and joy and it, this is just, yeah, I'll do my best here to try and explain the difference from a spiritual perspective. So Yogananda said everyone is seeking happiness. You know, whatever, whether they consciously are choosing a spiritual path 
or if they consciously have no interest in spirituality, everyone's interested in happiness. And one way to look at the difference between happiness and joy is that joy is a divine quality and it's independent of anything that's happening within our world, within our experience, and certainly outside of myself. It is, it is a state of being that is a pure reflection of God consciousness that is our own soul nature. So Yogananda said there are eight aspects of God consciousness that in this material realm we can tangibly experience. And um, one of them is joy. So the pursuit of happiness quite often is a pursuit of collecting things and experiences that are pleasurable. And for a moment, we feel happy. It feels good, <laughs> you know, that, oh, this, this makes me happy. I was listening one time to Swami I give a talk about happiness and the difference between external pleasure and internal, and he used ice cream as an example, and how excited we can get at the thought of ice cream. And it just so happened <laughs> that he had a friend in the community who used to pick up ice cream for him when he would go into Nevada City. And on this particular day, when he was using this example, he said, he said, John, you know, uh, gets ice cream for me and I enjoy it. And he, he was making the point that enjoying things is fine, it's just a dependence on those things. To feel joy is when we're contracted and limited. So in the talk, he was mentioning this, that you know John gets me ice cream and I enjoy it, but I don't need ice cream to feel joy. And as soon as he finished saying that, he said, but John, do get me ice cream today, right? <laughs> and we all laughed. I mean, I wasn't there, but I was listening to the tape and I laughed and you could hear the audience laughing. There, you know, Yogananda loved life. He, he really was one that appreciated God's presence in everything and was always pointing that out. And what he did was demonstrate perfect freedom, that we can enjoy this world when we know how to enjoy it rightly. And the right way to enjoy it is from an internal awareness of the divine qualities of God within us that um, is then manifested out in the world. And you can appreciate all those things that are in harmony with those inner qualities. And you can be aware of those things that are in discordance with it. Um, but your own divine self is unaffected by it. There's an affirmation in the yoga postures of um, Garudasana, the eagle pose. The affirmation is at the center of life storms, I stand serene. At the center of life storms, I stand serene. And that affirmation reminds us that in our very center, we are serene. We have the quality, the divine quality of calmness. We have the divine quality of peace. These qualities are untouched by the outer world. So Brahmacharya, um, I'll just to say a little bit more about working with the senses. So one of the pitfalls with sensuality is it's so magnetic and then we're supported very often in the culture to go more and more outside ourselves is what happens is we, we not only lose access to that inner abode of light and joy and peace, but our energy gets very dissipated. And so um, instead of becoming more alive and being able to live life more fully and more vibrantly, we become deadened, right? And if you've ever had the experience, I have had the experience of overindulging in something, at the end of it, you ha the experience is one of less energy and not more. So a classic example that many people can relate to is uh, in the United States is Thanksgiving. Um, so where they have, and it's, it's generally practiced as a big feast. So any, any feast that you've experienced, you might have experienced this. 
And there's a tendency culturally to overindulge on that day, right? That can be sometimes considered part of the fun of the day is the permission to eat too much, to eat and eat and eat and eat. And what happens at the end of the day when that's the practice is everyone lays around with no energy, <laughs> right? And they might have a certain sense of satisfaction. Oh, it feels good to be full or that was enjoyable. I enjoyed it. And I would say, depending on the health of the physical body, um, they can how they feel later will be dependent upon that. For some, boy, they they really can feel um, very uncomfortable and sometimes more than uncomfortable. But if that were a practice every day, so sometimes once a year, you know, a couple times a year. All right, you know you have the you have the physical health. The body can take it, and you, maybe you really enjoyed it. It was fun all day, so it gets mixed in with the event, and it, it doesn't stand out as to you as something. Boy, I don't want to do that again. But if you overindulge every day, and I'll just use eating as an example, um, besides the fact that. Um, the physical body is very likely to put on excess weight, which doesn't feel good. Your energy, um, it's very zapping. It's very draining. And that affects the consciousness as well. And, and that is an example of what can happen really in any area with our senses is we can become habituated to um, indulging, right? So we indulge a little bit and you know, a little bit now and then, oftentimes it's not a big deal. But if it's a habituated practice of overindulgence, you very quickly will experience um, what happens when our, when our energy and our consciousness is too outward and too much in something outside the self. It is a... Um, and, it, and another aspect of what happens is it blocks the flow of the divine energy. That one of the translations for brahmacharya is flowing with brahma, flowing with divine energy. So self-restraint actually can clear the pathway for energy to flow. Since I'm talking about food, I'll mention a practice that I've heard more and more of lately. And Yogananda spoke of, of this, and that's a practice of fasting. And there's different ways of practicing. Well, one way that can be relatively simple, and you have to, you have to make sure for yourself that it works for you. And anytime you're taking on a practice, I will say, especially if something like fasting, it's a good idea to check it out with your doctor if you've never done this before. Um, well, there's a practice of fasting that's called intermittent fasting. And that's where you create more space between meals. And one way to do that, kind of an, a fairly easy way to step into it, is to set a time in the evening where you won't eat later then. And it could be 7 o'clock. You, you get to pick whatever it is. And then you set a time that you won't eat before in the morning. could also be 7, 7 to 7, 8 to 8, whatever. That, that length of time gives your body rest. And in the evening, there's a lot of studies that look at the value of giving the body rest digestively at night. And that is self-restraint, right? Because if you have the habit or practice of eating in the evening, it's not easy to not, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna do something different. But if you have the ability to do that, if, especially if you've had a practice of eating in the evening, you very quickly can begin to feel the benefits energetically of what that does for the body. Waking up more refreshed, waking up with more energy, sleeping better at night. So these are recommendations that are very connected to brahmacharya. Um, let me see what else to say. Um, okay. So the other thing I was thinking is the application of any of the yamas and niyamas. It very much depends where you are in your journey. So if you are low in energy and 
it's difficult for you to get motivated. And you're just kind of noticing, like, my energy's low and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very inspired. I'm not very, um, I'm not very interested. You know, just kind of sluggish maybe in your life, energetically or in your consciousness. Um, I'm mentioning this because of likes and dislikes, because I talked about that before with our senses, right? We can be, um, we can kind of be, if we're very outward, we're just following them all the time. Well, if your energy is very low, and then you try to restrain, first off, it'll be very difficult to restrain because you don't have the energy to restrain. It takes energy to have self-restraint. So if you don't have any energy, it's very difficult to not do something. Um, but the other thing I want to say, and we look at this in yoga, um, we talk, I can't remember if I've mentioned before, I think I have talked about the gunas. And we talk about this in Raja Yoga uh, course a little bit. Um, today and this whole um, series on the yamas and niyamas, I'm referring very much from the Raja Yoga um, course book. The, so if your energy is low and you feel sluggish, sometimes it's very helpful to actually try to think of something you, you like and would be interested in and to, to move toward that to say, okay, even if it's something outside myself, right, which very often it is, oh, I like that, I'm interested in that. That gets my energy moving. Swamiji tells a story in Raja Yoga about energy, and, and he tells the story to say that energy is always there, but we're not always aware of it, and we don't always know how to work with it. And he talks about, you know, you're exhausted and he paints this wonderful picture of why you're so tired and you just don't have any energy. And then suddenly a friend you haven't seen in a long time, you love, comes to town, you get a call and you have all this energy. So, because um, you really want to do it, right? So suddenly, oh, there's all my energy. Well, it's valuable to get that energy flow moving and to keep it moving. So knowing where you are, and this could be um, a phase you're going through, right? it could be a phase, um, that you work with that state of consciousness, that state of energy, and make a choice based on that. So in that case, what I'm saying as an example is it could be a very good thing for you to find something that's pleasurable, that you're interested in, that does lift your energy, that does motivate you, be involved in it. And then once the energy is moving, direct some of that energy to a little bit more inward awareness, to a little bit more refinement. One of the refinements, and this can be um, really kind of at any level, but is seva, service. So service is, is something, it's a little challenging right now with shelter in place to find ways to serve. So I've been listening to people do different creative things. It's just wonderful because there are still ways. And so you could call someone who you know might need some support. Um, there's lots of different ways to serve, but Seva comes to mind, so I'll mention that. That once you get the energy flowing, okay, I love music, let's say, and maybe there's a certain kind of music. Oh, I want to... Um, I feel so old school. I would think in my mind, CD and now MP3, like however you get the music, get the music that you like as an example. The energy's moving. Now direct that energy towards something that is um, a little more refined in practice, that isn't so outside of where you are that it would feel burdensome and contractive. And that's one of the things that can happen with the yamas is that we can feel like, oh, I have to practice them in a particular way that isn't suited to where we are or who we are in this moment, right? So who we are is a divine soul. Where we are is on a spiritual journey. And where am I in that journey? I'll give a different example. Let's say you have a lot of energy. Maybe you're very high energy and tend a bit towards restlessness and agitation. So that, when you already have a lot of energy going, then movement that's very calm and soothing can be beneficial to smooth out the flow of energy, right? To calm the nervous system. That could be something like swimming maybe or bike riding or yoga asana practice, 
depending on how you do it, right? So if you go into that movement with the intention of, let me move in slow, deliberate ways, awareness of my breath, um, in the intention of calming the system, then movement can be a very good thing. And then you can take, you could come out of that experience and you might challenge yourself to uh, go inward with your awareness. Yoga, Ananda Yoga in particular, is very well suited to that. And from there, go into, use that awakened, calmed energy to practice meditation. Because you need a lot of energy to practice meditation. If we're very low in our energy and we try to meditate, we'll end up going to sleep. Right? We feel we get sluggish and sleepy. We can't, um, we d we can't find that inner abode of our divine soul without energy. We need energy for that. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because depending on where you are in the journey, what will be very appealing and appropriate for one person in the practice could be too much for someone else. So some of the simple ways we look at the practice of brahmacharya is diet, as I've mentioned, um, looking at that. Mm, let me see, I want to think about, there were so, there's so much, as I said, that I could say about this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, what do I want, what, do, let me think here for a moment. I think I'm just going to read a little bit from the Raja book. So true freedom ought to convey a sense of power, of expanding awareness and well-being. True peace and freedom require more, not less energy. A truly aware person is always one who possesses great energy, but great energy does not always generate great awareness. The direction of the energy flow, inward and upward, determines this. Learning to release tensions without losing energy. Two of the primary requirements for enjoying life to the fullest are the preservation of one's inner energy in its upward direction toward the brain. So this is part of what I've been talking about, that the practice of brahmacharya, of self-restraint, is being able to understand the principle that what we're doing is very often redirecting the flow of energy from outward to inward. And then when that energy is inward, we're lifting the energy up toward the point between the eyebrows. In yoga teaching, this is the movement through the chakra system, through the astral spine. So we often talk about the spine. There's the physical spine, but it's the energy spine within the physical spine that energy moves through. And as it lifts, it comes to the base of the skull, goes through the brain, and goes to the point between the eyebrows. Those inner energy centers open and energy awakens and we have access to this beautiful um, divine uh, qualities of light and joy and peace that I was saying earlier. So having a sense of, uh, I know what I wanted to say is that it's, it's, it's transmutation more than repression. And that's one of the things that people can get confused about with brahmacharya is a feeling that, oh, the self-restraint is I'm suppressing everything I like and I'm just trying not to like it. And instead, it's learning how to work with the things that you like, work with that energy. And as I said earlier, when the energy is awakened, to draw that back in and to raise that energy up. I would say that from the practice of doing this more and more, and it reminds me of something Yogananda said, that it's so often it's our own experience with this that will teach us the most about it. 
because when we hear about it, it can be, you know, we can kind of debate it. And um, that's what I've seen. I, I've, I've really had the pleasure of being in many classes on the Yamas and Niyamas in, with Ananda here in Palo Alto and up at the Expanding Light. And in the Expanding Light, I was often there for yoga teacher training. And that was the place where I would watch how students who were being exposed oftentimes, because I would go to lots of different classes there, to the yamas and niyamas for the first time, we'd get to brahmacharya and there would be a huge um, kind of upset, <laughs> not in everyone, but inevitably it there would be this confusion. Isn't the world good? Isn't it nice to enjoy things? Isn't it okay? And yes, it is. And so I, I think what I'm wanting to make sure of today when I talk about it is the, the more that you work with this principle and work with where you are, the more freedom you feel. So f doing simple things, like I mentioned intermittent fasting, or the practice of moderation. So if there's anything that you are enjoying, what would it feel like to do a little less? What would it feel like to not do it? And is there something you can offer yourself that would be, um, that helps you awaken energy and draw the energy inward and upward. So any of our tools in yoga that we talk about, kirtans, and there's many things right now you can attend online. So on Friday evenings, I don't know if it's every Friday, but if you've missed any of them, I believe they're all on the um, Ananda Palo Alto Facebook page. You can, any of the classes, these can be things that they, um, they awaken energy and they're always guiding it in and guiding it up. So, yeah, I'm just trying to think of, uh, I think these are the main points uh, that I wanted to say today. It's, it's a great blessing. So it's something that can confuse us. But when we understand how to work with it, we find more and more a sense of expansion and freedom. So the phrase, less is more, often comes to mind for me and I've really found that to be true. The, I guess the other piece that I would say about the practice is ultimately it develops for us a level of mastery around our energy and so we become, the, so the gift of self-restraint is the gift of um, having command of your energy and being able to choose which when we are habituated to overindulgence, we lose that sense of mastery, we lose that sense of self-command, and um, we become a prisoner to that, and it's really a horrible place to be. So if, you, if you've ever experienced it, um, if you're experiencing it now, you know what I'm saying. So the practice of brahmacharya, of all the yogic tools and practices, they give back to us a sense of mastery. They develop within us the ability to work with our energy and to choose. And in that, there's great freedom. I used to, um, as a girl and young woman, horse, go horseback riding a lot. I love horses. And one of the things that came to mind for me today is when your horse is well-trained and you have a good relationship with them, very little movements they will respond to. So you don't have to hold those reins so tight. You don't have to be constantly kind of exerting your will over the, over the horse. Um, instead, you have a feeling of partnership and collaboration and just, you know, the cl a clicking sound or a little bit of movement of your legs or a slight movement of the rein, and the horse will respond. And it's really a lovely relationship. And the senses are like that, that the more that when we get to a place of this cooperative spirit and we have a sense of control of what we're doing and control of the senses and we can guide them one way or the other, there is a, um, it's a lovely experience. And that's really a gift of brahmacharya, that in that place, we are then flowing with divine energy. We feel the blessing of that divine energy and we can utilize it and share it um, as we feel inspired to rather than uh, being run by it. 
So I invite you this week to practice brahmacharya in whatever way um, is suitable for you and, and see what you notice about your energy. See if it increases and you have more to share rather than less. It's great to be with you today. Thank you for being here. Wishing you many blessings on your day.